and uh, uh, which uh, for me is uh, the first conference after we released 3.0. So in a sense, it's an anti-climax. So we were building up to 3.0. Every release was uh, discussing more features changes, last minute changes. And then in May this year, on May 14th, we released uh, Scala 3.0, which was a monumental release with more than 28,000 commits, 7, 4,000 pull requests, and over 100 contributors. That was in May, so you uh, might ask, well, what happened since then? Well, uh, since then, we made steady point releases every six weeks, uh, mostly for bug fixes. So we were just cranking the thing and we essentially uh, did, uh, did uh, small uh, improvements everywhere where we could find them. Um, we use a train model. A uh, train model means that we have in parallel a final release, a point release, and then an RC for the next release. Uh, and uh, the, our period there is six weeks. So for six weeks, a release would be in RC and then it would become final. And at the same time, uh, the, uh, the, the next RC would be rolled out. So for instance, in October this year, so very, a couple of weeks ago, we released Scala 3.1 final. So that's a new minor release together with Scala 3.1.1 RC1. So that's the next one in RC. So it's a new release beyond 3.0 already, 3.1. What's new in 3.1? Well, a couple of things are new. Uh, one is that we uh, tightened the rules for experimental features. Uh, that's something that we just missed the 3.0 window. Uh, so essentially the motivation is that we want to avoid the uh, unchecked uh, propagation of essentially unofficial dialects uh, of Scala because essentially they lead to fragmentation and uh, 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 yeah, it's, it's very hard to, to keep a, a stable code basis. So to give you a, an example in Scala 2, there was, uh, for instance, uh, Scala macros, which were experimental, and then there was macro paradise and lots of other things. And they gave you essentially lots of different dialects of Scala that gave you different essentially possibilities what you could do. But of course, having new possibilities is great, except that uh, when when they, they change, uh, they are uh, discontinued or some of the features change, then it's usually painful. So we want to control that better. Uh, so we have this new notion of experimental, where we say an experimental feature is uh, uh, experimental if it requires a language import from Scala language experimental. So if these language imports that count as essentially experimental things. And furthermore, if you refer to a definition in the standard library or elsewhere that has the at experimental annotation, then that's also only possible in experimental code. So what is experimental code? Well, experimental features, these language imports and uh, definitions, they can only be used in a snapshot or nightly release. So we have nightly releases every um, every, uh, every every night, and you can essentially take a release there to experiment with experimental features. Or if that's too restrictive, then you can also access experimental features from definitions that are themselves labeled experimental. So it's transitive. Basically, we say experimental things can be only accessed from snapshot or nightly releases or from code that is experimental itself. So here's an example. Uh, let's say uh, we want to do the next step with the indentation syntax. We want to use the experimental fewer braces uh, feature, which would let you uh, write code that you see here. So essentially, it lets you write uh, uh, function arguments to this locally and to the flat map without braces. Uh, so, uh, that's nice, and we hope that it will be rolled in soon in a version of Scala, but it's not yet standard Scala. But you can still use that in a mainline compiler as long as the test method that we see here is itself uh, labeled experimental. If it has an experimental annotation, then you get access to all experimental features, and otherwise you have to be on a nightly or snapshot compiler. Okay, so that was experimental. What else is new? Well, we have a new experimental feature that's safer exceptions. 
so safer exceptions is essentially it brings back, you could say, uh, Java's checked exceptions without the downsides. Uh, so uh, you see the syntax at the bottom of the slide. Uh, so you have a throws declaration uh, for this function f. It throws a limit exceeded exceptions, and that gives you the right to actually throw uh, the exception. If the throws declaration would be uh, missing, uh, so you would just write def f from double to double equals, and you still have this import, say for exceptions, then the compiler would flag this thing as an error. It would say the limit exceeded exception is not declared in a throws class. You say, well, that looks exactly like Java checked exceptions, and when they uh, consider the mistake, it actually, if you look through the documentation of that feature, it's uh, essentially the fine print. The fine print here means that in particular you can be fully polymorphic, you can still use map and flat map and all your favorite high order functions with this checked exception feature and uh, it would still work transparently. And that's one thing that does not work with Java's checked exception and that's in my mind the biggest downside. So that's something that's new. Um, another thing is on the tooling side in the compiler we brought back uh, wconf and no warn from 213. So essentially uh, the wconf flag allows filtering and configuring compiler warnings. You can silence them or you can turn them into errors and so on. And we also have uh, brought back the no warn uh, annotation from Scala 213 that was originally in the silencer plugin. And that one can be used for suppressing warnings directly in the code in the places where they're expected to, to occur. So if you want to essentially suppress a warning in some particular code, then you essentially slap a no warn uh, annotation on the outside of that code and the warning will be suppressed. Good. Is that all? Well, there are a couple of other minor, minor things in 3.1, but yes, basically that's all. Plus, of course, lots of bug fixes. So you could ask, say, well, why make it a minor bump? Why isn't that a 3.0.3 or 3.0.4? Well, uh, the uh, sarcastic answer is because we can. Uh, but the more detailed answer would be, well, we had to add some new definitions to the standard library. And by our new release policies, that forces a minor version bump. So as soon as we add anything to the standard library, we need to make it a minor version bump. So what is the compatibility policy? Well, the compatibility policy is that bug fix releases, so X in the third uh, position, are forwards and backwards binary compatible, just like in Scala 2. So they can be freely replaced with each other, uh, drop-in replacements backwards and forwards. Uh, for uh, minor releases, uh, we have uh, that they are backwards compatible. So that's something new compared to Scala 2, where a minor release 2.13 versus 2.12, let's say, is not compatible at all. The world has to be recompiled, the whole ecosystem has to migrate. And that's no longer true in Scala 3, and that's in Scala 3 policy is really quite liberating, because in Scala 3, a class compiled with Scala 3.1 can freely access a class compiled with uh, Scala 3.0. And in fact, it can even access a class compiled with Scala 2.13 as well. So backwards compatibility goes back to 2.13. But the opposite is actually false. So a class compiled with Scala 3.0 cannot access a class compiled with Scala 3.1. So that's the lack of forward compatibility. And why is that? Well, uh, it's because the class B that's compiled with 3.1 might call a standard library method that does not exist in 3.0. Remember, I said the minor releases, we have the freedom to add new methods to the standard library, so class B might well have called that method. And that would be, if we run that, uh, if we would let you compile both A and B in this mixed mode, that would be a runtime error, because when, you, when the class B executes and it calls the standard lib method that doesn't exist in the 3.0 system, you'd get a linkage error. And we prefer uh, compile time errors over runtime errors. So uh, for that reason, we don't even let you compile the class A if it calls into a class B that's compiled with a later version of Scala. Okay, so some people 
think if you look at that and you sort of use this kind of uh, two uh, version scheme, then this sounds quite severe. And in fact, we address this thing with mitigations. So there is, uh, or to be more precise, we will address this with mitigations. So we discussed with developers and uh, we decided we would add a new command line flag that lets you overwrite the release. So you could write something like what we see here, Scala C minus Scala target 3.0, and then anything in lib star Scala. Uh, and that would essentially give you the, uh, uh, the uh, produce uh, binaries with the uh, assumed version of 3.0. So that means that uh, your, uh, you, essentially, you cannot call any of the new library methods, of course, but on the other hand, other 3.0 uh, classes can still ca call into into, you, uh, into this class that has been compiled with 3.0. So it's like backwards time travel, really. And there's also an annotation that lets you indicate the version in which a method is introduced, and we'll do that for essentially all new standard library methods. So the annotation is called since, it just tells you from which version on that method existed. So the rules then would be that if you compile uh, without Scala target, you always uh, target the last uh, version of the, of the compiler, in this case 3.1 right now. Uh, if you compile with Scala target, then uh, there are essentially two rules. One is you can't uh, use any library that's compiled with a target that's later than the target you compile to. And two is you can't call any standard library method that exists only after the target that you compile to. So those are the rules. Um, the, the, it, there's a, uh, not to con the, this whole Scala target shouldn't be confused with source versions. That's essentially another mechanism to, to handle language migration and, and uh, different versions of the sources. So if I write Scala C source 3.0, and that fixes the source version to be 3.0. What that means is that it will prevent, the compiler will prevent me from using any new source features that were introduced after 3.0. And uh, it will also not impose any restrictions that we will impose after 3.0. So these are essentially source, what we pass in the source, whereas the target thing is uh, the binary that we compile to, technically. The tasty version that we compile to gets a version, and that's affected by Scala target. Staying with source for a second, uh, there's also source uh, migration. So some of these uh, sources have a migration flag, and that helps you upgrade to the given source version. So for instance, a minus source 3.0 migration is a big help to migrate Scala 2.13 sources to 3.0 because it will temporarily let you essentially get away with certain things that are no longer allowed in 3.0 and it will also essentially give you upgrade hints and even uh, automatic rewrites if you desire to the new version. So 3.0 migration is a very useful step to go from 2.13 to 3. So my recommendation would be to always use the latest Scala version, so 3.1, 3.2 when it comes out, and use Scala target only if you're worried that other source that cannot upgrade might depend on you. And I believe generally that's probably overblown. So if you have a concrete situation where somebody tells you, no, we can't upgrade, you have to stay on 3.0 or whatever, then there's Scala target for you. If you don't know of anything specific, then I would just go ahead and use the latest one because with backwards compatibility, really, as long as everybody's on the latest compiler, which is also the essential compiler with the least bugs, uh, everybody should be okay. <coughs> um, and finally, the minus source flag would be then used for source code migration. So if you want to upgrade, either keep your source to an older version or help get help with upgrades. So the um, plan for 3.x, so the future uh, 3 uh, dot, uh, minus 3 versions would then be that we want to keep the training model. So we want to have regular and frequent releases every six weeks. And that means that bugs, if you stay on the latest compiler, will be addressed really quickly. And I see that already, uh, that, uh, that that already works. Uh, uh, you can already see a benefit from that. I had the impression that recently, the, the number of reported bugs has actually come down uh, by a significant amount. So the fact that we actually have fairly uh, 
fast uh, reaction to that seems to stem essentially that uh, the, the problems and we seem to be on top of new 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 issues and new bugs. Uh, the other um, the plan then is we will roll out minor versions depending on need, but my guess estimate would be every four to six months. So basically whenever we have enough accumulated issues that require uh, some new things to be added to the standard library, then instead of a bug fix, we will do a minor version. But like I said, uh, for, for most uh, users, it should be completely transparent because of backwards compatibility. So a minor version then can add new features to the standard library. It can add new features to the source language or also to Tasty, and it can impose deprecations and restrictions. So with all these policies, and uh, now that I have essentially given out the, the, the fine print and the detailed rules, what's where do we, where are we going? So what what, what are our goals to? Uh, for the next versions and generally where Scala should be going. So I think at least my goal, and I believe the goal of many of us, is we want to uh, go towards more simplicity. And we have already made a good start with that because we dropped many major Scala 2 hurdles. Starting with the macro system, where I think many people have uh, by now acknowledged that the new uh, macros in Scala 3 are uh, maybe a bit more restrictive, but a lot safer and more predictable than what we had in Scala 2. Uh, delayed in it is no longer a thing. Uh, early definitions uh, are gone. Existential types uh, are gone. Type projection, at least the general form, that the T here is a, an abstract type, is no longer there. So uh, you can't, uh, for instance, do uh, homebrewed lambdas anymore, and, you know, all these things that essentially bypass the type system. Uh, simple literals, uh, non-local returns, do while, and uh, limit 22. So essentially uh, the, uh, the artificial limit for tuples and functions of uh, RIT 22 is gone, so now they can, have, can be as large as possible. Why is that a simplification? Well, because it uh, avoids a lot of fairly complicated and tricky code that try to work around this restriction with uh, whatever. Um, so all these things are, uh, I think, a considerable simplification in the language because they remove things that were quite ha hairy to understand, uh, like existential types of type projection. It didn't really work that well with type inference and uh, that generally were sort of a hurdle to, to read Scala code. I think we greatly cleaned it up, and I'm, I'm very happy about that. Uh, we're not done with that yet, so uh, more is to come over the next versions. Uh, so, for instance, we'll uh, get rid of XML literals, uh, of uh, private this and protected this. So, that basically, the, that this part will be inferred instead of given explicitly. Uh, will uh, essentially simplify quite a few syntax, uh, syntax aspects, uh, syntax quirks. Uh, so for instance, instead of the uh, x colon underscore star for a varag argument, it's, it will, it's now just x star. Uh, instead of the uh, block with, uh, with a parameter, so essentially a function on the right that you see here, where there was a special rule that you don't have to write the parameters, uh, you don't have to write parentheses around the x parameter. So that rule is gone. So now uh, uh, on the left, you have to write the parents. Uh, the import uh, underscore has been replaced by a star, uh, as any other language does. And uh, the perhaps a bit cryptic x arrow y for import renaming has been replaced by as. All these things are already active. <coughs> Sorry. The left part of these things is already uh, uh, implemented, of course, so you can use this today. And uh, the, uh, sorry, the right parts will be uh, uh, removed in the future, and you can already remove them now if you uh, use as the source version future. So you can say minus source future, and that would essentially prevent you from writing any of this stuff that will be deprecated in the future. And then, of course, uh, the, big, the biggie is the whole 
old style implicit con uh, complex so implicit conversions old style implicit parameters implicit everything uh, will be uh, removed but for these ones we don't have a fixed uh, version yet and, and that's not yet done uh, but hopefully over the next years let's say uh, we will uh, hopefully be able to get rid of them um, another thing that uh, already happened uh, and that, that we can opt in is that we tighten the rules for exhaustivity of path pattern matching in several dimensions. So here's one um, in the for expression, uh, if you had a, a for word, colon, colon, rest, taken from lines, yield, then uh, essentially that goes through a sequence of lines and each line is supposed to be a list of words. And it says, well, let's match the list, so the, the first word and the rest. But what happens if a line is empty? Then uh, the uh, without the, uh, so with the case now, this will filter. So it will simply skip any lines that are empty, that do not match the pattern on the left. And that's a behavior that's very useful to have. It gives you very nice and beautiful queries. But uh, it's, in a sense, it's, uh, it's, in a sense, it's loose typing. So. What if you want uh, the, uh, the type on the left to conform on the type of the right, and you want the compiler to check that? So we now distinguish between, between the two cases. If you have a case, then you get the filtering behavior, which is the same as the previous uh, Scala 2 behavior. If you don't have a case, then uh, this thing would be uh, a, 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 a uh, lack of exhaustivity pattern uh, pattern matching. You would say, well, I can't prove that lines has this uh, uh, that uh, the, the line, but lines can be empty, and you haven't uh, accounted for that pattern. A similar case is if we just match with a val. So you could also do this uh, before without the unchecked. You could have a list, and you could just match uh, with x and xs. And if the list was empty, then that would give you a uh, a, a match error at runtime. Uh, and again, we essentially now tighten the rules and say you can't do that. Uh, if you write it without the unchecked, that will give you a compile time error, but essentially that's not exhaustive, uh, and you have to give the unchecked option uh, to, to make it work. All these things can be turned on today with the minus source future uh, uh, command line option or with the language import import language dot future. Uh, so you can already essentially uh, live in, in this uh, uh, world where uh, these things happen and we will uh, roll these uh, in fairly soon over the next uh, minor versions of uh, six months, 12 months, something like that. And then there are not just restrictions, but there are also new language features to make life simpler. And we have actually quite a few of them. And I, the, my, the talk is already uh, over half time, so I don't have time to essentially do an exhaustive list. I'll just do a few examples. Um, generally, uh, the, we, I, I see that there's room to grow. So uh, Scala is sometimes perceived to be a very complicated language. Maybe that's true, I don't know. But it's not complicated because it's large. So if people say Scala is complicated because it has a zillion features, then that's simply wrong. It actually has fewer features than many competing languages, including Kotlin, Swift, Java 8, many, many, way fewer than C++ and way, way fewer than C Sharp. So it's not the number of features in Scala that is the thing that makes Scala complex. I believe it's the interaction of things that are very, very orthogonal, and the expressive power on the, uh, of the language that lets people do fairly complicated stuff. I think that's, that's really the thing. So the plan is to essentially not be overly concerned with essentially the size of the grammar or the number of keywords or whatever, uh, but to be concerned about essentially how can we simplify the experience of new developers and uh, all developers, really. So one thing that really makes life simpler for a lot of us uh, is uh, top-level main methods. Uh, so here you can have, a, what, what you see here is a method, happy birthday, takes two parameters, an int, a string, and uh, a, a list of strings, and it essentially does the computation to have a nicely formatted 
happy birthday message. So that for that is a main program. You can use that as your main entry point in the program. What you do no longer need to do is essentially write a method that takes an array of strings and do all the formatting yourself. In fact, what this would do is it would translate to a Java class, which is called Happy Birthday. So you can run it then with Scala Happy Birthday or Java Happy Birthday. And that Java class would have a customized main method that does all the conversion from a string and so on. And that main method calls into this Happy Birthday method to do the actual work. So that's how that works. Another thing where I believe life got a lot simpler in Scala 3 is extension methods. So to, if you haven't seen extension methods yet, here's a simple example from the documentation. Uh, so let's say we have a class circle uh, with the uh, x and y and radius as uh, fields. And then we can take uh, make an extension method circumference for circle that gives you the uh, circumference of the circle with the usual formula. And you call that, as you see at the bottom of the uh, of the uh, code here, you uh, can call that with circle dot circumference and not essentially circumference of circle. So by having this syntax where we, we write extension, then a parameter, and then essentially the, the method with the rest of the parameters, we get dot syntax without having to put this thing in a separate class. Uh, what does that translate to? Well, it actually translates to a regular method in the class, in the scope where we wrote extension. So there will be just a method circumference uh, that takes a circle as parameter, gives you the double. And uh, that, in, in fact, you can uh, try that out by just in that scope calling circumference directly. That's also possible. So you, uh, at the bottom line here, you see circle.circumference equal circumference and circle, and that's true because it's actually the same method that is called on both sides. Okay, so you see there's really no inner object or class or things created. Extension methods are just essentially a way to represent normal methods with a different call syntax, with a dot call syntax. But it actually doesn't stop there. Uh, the interesting thing then is that you can also have collective extension methods. So here's an example of that. We can have a single extension, in this case over a sequence of strings, and two methods. One is uh, longest strings, uh, which essentially does, uh, uh, the, uh, the, gives you all the possible strings uh, of maximal length. And then uh, we might have another method, longest string, which calls the previous method longest strings and gives you the head of that, of that list. So what that essentially gives you is uh, a uh, economy of notation. You don't have to repeat yourself with the same uh, previous parameters, uh, which of course, if you write a, a class, then that's the same thing because class can have parameters. So extension methods are essentially on parity with classes there. And it doesn't stop there either. So instead of just having a single uh, term parameter, you can also have type parameters in the extension head or using clauses in the extension head and so on. So you can essentially do everything you could do with an implicit class. So I've said implicit classes instead, in, in fact, extension methods are supposed to replace implicit classes. So here would be the same extension method that we've seen before as an implicit class. So we have to give it a name, let's say list smallest, and then the body of the class is actually very similar or exactly the same as the previous one in the extension methods. So implicit classes are really syntactic sugar for syntactic, for implicit conversions. Uh, and that's something that we want to get, get away from. So the implicit conversions are essentially something that often leads to unpredictable code. So extension methods are really uh, something that is supposed to replace implicit classes because implicit classes are essentially just a, a form of implicit conversion. And Beyond that, extension methods also have a really important benefit, and that's that they can be abstracted. They can be abstract. So here you have, uh, for instance, a, a, a trade semigroup, and it has a combined method, which is an extension method. So you write uh, group dot uh, element dot combine our element, and but that method is abstract. You haven't given an implementation, and uh, you can give that implementation in a subclass of the trade or 
in this case here in a uh, given instance, which is essentially a, uh, uh, what, what part of the new implicit, where we said that's an instance of, in this case, monoid of string, where we now define the combined method to be the string concatenation. That's something that is actually huge because uh, previously it was super, super hard to do that in, uh, in, in Scala 2. Essentially, you, you have to have uh, the, the define the implicit classes and then in addition view implicit classes and it, it was really not, not pretty and, and very fragile. So the simple fact that we can abstract extension methods, that we can make them abstract, is, is a huge win here. On the other hand, you could say implicit, implicit classes actually also have a benefit, an important benefit, uh, which extension methods right now do not have, and that's that they can add methods in bulk. So here you see uh, a class which is essentially comes more or less from the Scala standard library. So we have an array sequence, which is a sort of uh, form of sequence, and it has an apply method, which is just array indexing, and it has a length method, which is just the array length, but it wraps uh, essentially uh, an array to be a sequence. And then we want to have a class array ops as an implicit class. That's the class that essentially gives you all the sequence uh, operations on array. So uh, array ops uh, allows you to do that. And the way it's, it works is that it's an implicit class. It takes an array and it just extends array seek. Uh, that means that you get all the methods, you get the apply and links, plus all the other seek methods that are inherited. And with extension methods, you don't have that because you don't have this inherited uh, notion that an extension method, extension block can inherit something that defines uh, some default behavior. On the other hand, uh, we have a possible solution. Uh, so we're looking into that now, and it probably will also come fairly soon, that uh, we would allow export clauses in extension blocks. So this thing, an export, is essentially a, a way of to compose, so essentially it favors composition or inheritance. Um, and in this case, then we would replace the inheritance of the implicit class with an export class. It would say, well, uh, we have an extension method for on arrays again. And instead of defining all the possible defs that we have here, we just say, well, uh, we export all the members of, in each case, uh, forming an array CQ of excess. And, uh, and and having the, the, the same method here. So that's something that hopefully will come fairly soon. And once we do that, then I think we can retire implicit classes. The third thing that I wanted to mention is the tooling. Uh, and uh, that's something that's uh, quite new. Uh, that's that Scala uh, is about to have a, a standard command line interface, a CLI. Uh, so the problem with essentially getting into Scala today, which I believe many people realize, is that you need a build tool. Uh, you need a build tool because, um, uh, except for the really uh, super simplest cases, is you need a build tool as soon as you define libraries that you depend on. So if you depend on any library in the Maven universe, then you have to give the Maven coordinates somewhere, and to do that, you need a build script. Uh, or, or you might also uh, want to define the Scala version, for instance, and say, well, this thing needs Scala 3.1 or Scala 3.13.7 or whatever, and then, then again, you need a build tool. Uh, the problem with that is that you, from the beginning, as soon as you do that, which is very, very early on, really, in Scala, you have to learn two languages instead of one. It's true that typically you don't have to learn much from the built language, but still, you have to learn it, and there are hidden dragons. So essentially, even if you only know a small subset, then uh, other things can surface very quickly, so it's scary. Or, of course, you could use something like Ammonite, which lets you define the dependencies that it depends on, but that's only a REPL and scripting engine, and that doesn't really scale beyond single files. So that's the situation today. Um, the Scala CLI, what you can do is uh, you can essentially do compile, run, and test your Scala code all with a simple command, and you don't need a build script here. So here you see on the right uh, some, some of the things you do. So here we essentially run demo.scala as a script, and that would, would essentially give you the output that you see here. Here's another example where essentially 
uh, we uh, test the de demo Scala. So uh, uh, that would give you a test error here. Uh, so the test uh, program here is an unit. And um, here's another one which uh, uh, compiles simply demo.scala and that would give you a compile time error here. So you can essentially do the basic things uh, from the command line in a terminal out of the box without needing a build tool. And I should say that that Scala CLI, uh, it comes from Virtus Lab. And on the uh, bottom here, you see the URL that uh, lets you find out more. I, but the build tool, it doesn't actually stop there. So you can also do other things like you can format and package your Scala code. So here you see the main class, we format it, it comes out nicer. We package it uh, so that essentially gives you an, an, an application that you can run here. Uh, it also supports multiple Scala versions. So here you have an enum uh, class and you can run it with 302 and that uh, essentially would give you uh, the value of that. Or uh, we can uh, try to run it with 213 and that would give you uh, an error because of course enums are not supported in 213. Uh, it also runs with uh, JS and native. So here you see uh, we can have a JS program and uh, we can essentially run that with, a, uh, with, a, with Node or we can have a native program. Uh, we can run it with native and that only works for Scala 2 so far because native isn't on 3 yet. It takes a bit longer to compile, but uh, in the end uh, we also have some. So you can say, okay, so this is amazing. This is really nice. Uh, but have you just invented another build tool? Uh, so what's missing from a build tool? In fact, there are two key things missing, and I think the first one is uh, decisive. There are no build scripts. So there's no build language that lets you write a program to do your build. So this is essentially meta level. You write a program to build other programs. That's missing. So in that sense, it's basically just a convenient command, a uh, sequence of commands, uh, instead of a build tool. So, and that also means you only need one lang language to learn the whole thing. There's nothing else there. The other thing that uh, the other restriction that compared to build tools is that this thing is a single project only. So you can't have multi-project builds with this uh, with, with, with this Scala CLI. It's a single project. So what what this is meant for is to say, well, all the programmers that want to try out things in Scala, that are application developers, students, they should be able to do that without having to learn about a build tool. Once you start to have something really complicated, multiple projects or build scripts, where essentially you, build, you have to build certain artifacts that use other artifacts and things like that, then maybe you're ready for a build tool. But you shouldn't be forced to use it from the start. So that's essentially the, the motivation here. Uh, so there's one thing that we have to cover still in these things. Uh, that's basically the reason why we couldn't use this Scala C compiler out of the box. We have to uh, uh, do something about config. Uh, so in particular, we want to say we want to use certain libraries, certain Maven libraries, also maybe certain Scala versions, uh, and maybe uh, command line options and things like that. So for that, we have a, a new directive called a using directive. And the using directive, the syntax is super simple. It starts with using, then comes a key, which is an identifier, and then come a six, comes a sequence of words that could be basically anything. Uh, and that's essentially interpreted by the Scala CLI tool or hopefully in the future, other tools as well. Uh, so that essentially replaces, if you think Ammonite, the IV imports, where there was a special form of import that would now be expressed with a using directive. Um, you can also use it, like I said, to specify command line options or things like that. You could say, well, why is it called using? Uh, well, uh, isn't there an overlap with the using classes that we use for implicit parameters? Yes, there is. And that's actually intentional because the, uh, the, the essence of the two is very similar. So in both cases, using gives essentially a requirement to your context. It says something that in the context around the thing that I look at has to be true or has to be given. So here we say the con in the context we want to say that we need the org scala meta and unit for with the version that's given, or we need to essentially use scala 3.1 as the compiler. So in that sense, there are also context requirements just like the using clauses. 
So uh, that's the end of the talk. Uh, I uh, will stay uh, on for questions and, and comments. But I, to, to finish, I also have a question for you. What do you think about that? Do these changes make your life simpler? Do they help get others or uh, yourself maybe getting up to speed with Scala? Also, what other innovations would be welcome? In the language, maybe, in the tooling, in the libraries, in the docs or the ecosystems. I would be interested to uh, hear about your opinion on these things. Thank you. Hi, Martin. Thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, let's get right into Q&A. And I see we have one question. Hopefully some more come in while we are answering this first one. Our question is, some of the future planned syntax changes, such as import to px as y, look similar to Python syntax. Was this intentional? Uh, I think Python, yeah, well, um, it was inspired by Python, yeah. Uh, I think Python has generally a fairly quiet syntax, which is nice. And uh, it's also syntax that's, of course, by now well known. So if you say, well, if, uh, with the import syntax where we said, well, that's sort of a quirk, you could say, of previous Scala, that it was sort of different from other languages, so what should it be like? And then I would certainly say, well, not the Go import syntax, which is also really uh, bizarre. But Python looks, looks very intelligible and very readable. So you know immediately what it is. And I think that's something that, uh, that's definitely a good thing to imitate. Great, what a, what a great question. And thank you for, for answering that. Let's go on, we have another question here. Where do you see Scala as a language in three years? Um, that's, an, that's an interesting question. Um, so, I, so, I, what I see for Scala uh, is that it is establishing a third way between imperative object oriented programming and pure functional programming. And I think that's sort of something that was very hard to, um, to promote initially because it was just so new. So people were not used to that. And so you say, well, you have to be a better Scala or uh, a Haskell on the JVM. And I believe that's absolutely not true. That what was always my vision that this should be it should be neither one nor the other. Uh, but to fill this with essentially applications and libraries and essentially documentation community takes time. And I hope that we will be a lot further in three years than now. And that it will be universally accepted that that that's what it is. Um, the, the other thing that interests me a lot from the research angle, and we might see some things happening over the next three years, is uh, essentially to have, get better type systems for resources and effects. Uh, where with a resource, I mean something that has some restrictions. Uh, a file that is closed and you can't access it afterwards. Uh, memory that you maybe want to uh, manage manually rather than relying on the garbage collector. Uh, things like that. And an effect is what we know what effects are there, essentially things that are not the usual inputs and outputs of functions, everything that makes a function not referentially transparent. So we need, I believe we need better ways to deal with them both. And I believe that actually we have some foundations to, to get that to work, uh, to link resources and effects by this idea of capabilities where capabilities are essentially the, the, the implicit parameters. So in Scala 3, we essentially renovated that, and we think we have now a really nice basis to talk about context. I hope it will be universally adopted and promoted. And I believe we can use that also as a new basis for resources and effects. But that's sort of a research agenda, and we'll see where that, where that leads. Great, thank you. 
Our next question is, would you recommend using Scala CLI when teaching Scala to people right now, or should we wait a bit longer? Well, it's, it's very, very new. Uh, I think you should try it out yourself. Generally, I believe it has great potential for, uh, for teaching. Uh, uh, yeah, so I would definitely give it a try and then decide whether, whether it's already ready for you or not. Fantastic. We have a few more questions here for you, Martin. Let's move on to the next one. Okay. How does the main syntax deal with function params? I guess it maps them from the command line. Yes. Uh, so the uh, the idea is that there is a uh, from a string uh, class, uh, essentially a type class, that you can define yourself. That uh, and that is defined for essentially things like ints or uh, numbers or, or other things. So the idea is you, you, you get it from the command line, you, you go into the standard uh, Java main method that uh, treats command line arguments as an array of strings. And then you take each command line argument and you convert it uh, via this type class to the main method. I should say that right now we have um, a fairly simple implementation of what main can do. We're currently looking at more refined implementations that let you do more. So right now, essentially, the defaults are intentionally to say we want to do the minimum, and we are we, we know that we want to be more expressive in the future. Uh, the other uh, thing, uh, point of generalization for main methods is right now they only deal with essentially command line arguments, but there's not really a good reason for that. Uh, so as how Yi has remarked, uh, you could also use essentially something like main as an entry point for uh, for a web server or things like that. So where you could put it on essentially your method and then there would be automatic uh, essentially un-serialization, deserialization from HTTP uh, messages and, or things like that. So the plan is to uh, generalize main. So main, will, main itself will always be main methods, but to have other annotations like main that can do other kinds of entry points to programs. So generally, we want to have sort of a flexible way to uh, define the mappings from uh, an environment of a program, could be, like I said, web or, uh, or command line or whatever, to uh, the, uh, the methods and arguments to these methods that are called in the program. Fantastic. I'm going to jump to another question, and we just have a few left. Is it possible that future releases will be coordinated more with tooling developers like Metals and JetBrains, so things will be ready for industry adoption once a new language version drops? Um, well, I, I think it's important to be to be predictable, and uh, the way we are predictable that we say we'll have a new version every six weeks. And uh, so there's a steady release train of essentially improvements and new versions. Uh, and uh, I think that if we could, I mean, we, the one thing we do is that we keep everybody on board. So we have meetings, regular meetings with the uh, metals people and also with the jet planes people to say what our plans are. Uh, in, in, in the future. But I don't believe in trying to hold up versions to sort of make them uh, completely linked uh, because uh, that, that typically delays things. So it's better to just essentially do this regular crank out things and then uh, that should work. Um, just noting I'm low on power. Uh, I don't know, do you have a power supply somewhere? Thanks. Okay. Okay. Um, going on to our next question here. Was there any interesting process or experience when you were working on Scala 3? For example, was there any controversial features that's getting some backlash from the community? Uh, there was quite a few, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think overall that was really good because we, uh, we, we could improve things a lot. So I'm thinking of essentially the, the, the new uh, givens. And there was a lot of discussion about that. And 
some of the early designs, which um, I should say that they, they probably resemble mostly what uh, what Swift does in this in this area. That uh, that was not liked at all by many developers, and I believe that uh, in the end we 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 got a much better solution now. So that was really good. Uh, other things that were really controversial uh, were uh, the uh, the indentation. Uh, Lots of people hated it, uh, and we went back and forth and back and forth, and we tried many, many different things, and in the end, we settled on what we have now, which we actually had for a while, but not after ha having tried out many, many other different different things. Uh, so that was something where, where essentially uh, the developer community was very split. There were, there were many who really liked the feature and wanted it, and there were others who sort of were super skeptical. Uh, it's often with syntactic features like that. I have the impression that with uh, more usage, uh, people will actually want to it and uh, it will become a standard uh, like, like the others. All right. Well, let's, um, let's stop here, question-wise, uh, as we are running a little bit short on time. Martin, I'd love to thank you once again for joining us today and for such a great Q&A session. Um, it's really a pleasure having you here with us. Thank you, Alison. Thank you. <laughs>